Hi, and welcome to AP Chemistry Review. It's me, Dr. V, and it's time to do some chemistry problems. You want to make sure you're ready for that exam in May. So we're working on free response question number three from the 2018 exam. It was one of the long free response questions from that exam, and it scored out of 10 points. This session will be most useful to you if you try to do the problem on your own. You'll need your calculator, you'll need your periodic table, you'll need the formula sheet. And like I said, you really should try to do the whole problem on your own. Certainly try to work through each part before you listen to my explanation. That's really how you'll get the most out of this. And then keep the score of your work. How are you doing? Did you earn the point? Do you not earn the point? Uh, and try and get a feel for how you're progressing. All right, so this question was about iron and its ions, iron two plus and iron three plus, those being the common two ions of iron. Part A, write the ground state electron configuration of the Fe2 plus ion. Now, AP Chem students should know how to write electron configurations for neutral atoms and for ions. This question was scored out of one point, so it was pretty much all or nothing. All right, so what you have to remember here is the Aufbau principle. We fill orbitals in order of increasing energy. It is a plus two ion, so we need to make sure we count electrons, that we lose two electrons and represent that properly in our electron configuration. So what we have to write, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6. Now, you might be sitting here going, wait a minute, there's a sublevel missing. Well, that's true. The d block elements are going to lose their outermost s electrons first to form those cations. So the 4s sublevel is not occupied at all. And so we need to write that. I can't tell you how often I remind my own students of this, um, but if they're asking for an electron configuration of a transition metal cation, lose your S electrons first before you start losing D electrons. So this actually is the answer that you need to have. Now, of course, they did accept credit for noble gas notation, which would be argon 3D6. Make sure you've got those square brackets. Uh, they didn't specify what notation to use. Either one of these is fine. Suppose if you really wanted to use arrows and boxes, that would have been accepted as well. But since they didn't require that and it takes longer to write, I didn't do that. All right, so really a pretty easy one point. But if you didn't have, <laughs> if you didn't remember the S electrons being lost first, then you might not have gotten it. It's a very common error to lose the D electrons first. Part B, the radii of the ions are given in the table above. There it is. Using principles of atomic structure, explain why the radius of the iron two ion is larger than the radius of the iron three ion. So they really want you to talk about atomic structure. So we're looking at protons, electrons, electron configurations, those kinds of details here. This question was also scored out of one point. We know that both ions have the same nuclear charge. They both have 26 protons, right? So whether you needed to state that explicitly, not so clear. Um, but it certainly won't hurt. Um, the iron 2 plus electron, uh, ion would have 24 electrons, and the iron 3 ion would have 23 uh, electrons. Um, but they're both occupying the same energy levels. They both lost the S electrons in the 4S sublevel, and so um, the iron 3 ion has lost one additional electron from the 3D sublevel. So it's 3D5 instead of 3D6, like the iron 2. That's really the key to everything here, all right? The iron 2 ion has more electrons occupying those same energy levels, specifically the 3D sublevel. I've got six electrons in the 3D sublevel for Fe2 plus versus five electrons in the 3D sublevel for Fe3 plus. So there are more electron-electron repulsions in the iron 2 ion than in the iron 3 ion, and therefore the iron 2 ion will have a larger radius. Okay. Uh, and that's really the gist of what you need to say. Bullet points are great. More than three or four, you shouldn't have to write a whole lot. Um, okay, iron three ions interact more strongly with water molecules in aqueous solution than iron two ions do. Give one reason for the stronger interaction and justify your answer using Coulomb's law. Now, this question was also scored out of one point. We've got a lot of small things that we need to do here in order. And Coulomb's law, right, is a way of talking about the strength of interactions here between opposite uh, an ion and a polar molecule. 
there are two main factors that affect the strength of a Coulombic attraction. One is the magnitude of the charge. When the charge goes up, the strength of the attraction increases. We don't have to write out Coulomb's law or the formula to do this. We can explain it all con conceptually, but we do need to have something with some math-based reasoning. Since iron 3 plus has a higher charge than Fe2 plus, um, iron 3 plus will have a stronger Coulombic attraction to the water. So that would be perfectly fine in terms of credit. There is another way to answer this question. You could talk about the distance dependence. The closer the particles are, the stronger the attraction. When the particles are farther away, the Coulombic attraction goes down. All right. Since iron 3 ion has a smaller radius than iron 2 plus, the iron 3 ion can get closer to the water molecule and that would give it a stronger Coulombic attraction. So either one of these is sufficient. You don't have to do both. Don't be tempted to write down everything. You probably don't have time for that. Um, so either way, iron 3 ion has a stronger Coulombic attraction to the water molecule. All right, let's go on. The student can, obtains a solution that contains an unknown concentration of iron 2 ions. We want to find the concentration of it in solution, so we're going to do a titration with permanganate ion, which converts iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus, and we're given the balanced equation. All right, so it's a really nice redox reaction, and the next thing we're asked to do is to write the balanced equation for the half reaction for the oxidation of iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus. So again, this was scored out of one point, pretty much all or nothing. What you have to remember here is that oxidation is a loss of electrons, so the oxidation number goes up. Now you're already told in the balanced equation that iron 2 is a reactant and iron 3 is the product, but just in case you weren't sure about that, that does need to go up. All right, so our balanced equation is that iron 2 plus will make iron 3 plus and an electron. You have to have that written down. So we're showing conservation of both mass and charge. Right, the sum of the charges is the same on both sides, uh, and that's a check for yourself to make sure you've written the equation correctly. The student then titrates a 10.0 milliliter sample of this iron 2 plus solution. Calculate the value of the iron 2 plus in the solution. If it takes 17.48 milliliters of 0.0350 molar potassium permanganate to reach the equivalence point of the titration. So now we've got a really nice stoichiometry question solution-based stoichiometry. All right, it was worth two points. And we have to do a little bit of math here. Nothing we can't handle. But there are places where you have to really pay attention to what you're doing. All right, so I always encourage my students to think about what we know. We know the volume of the iron 2 plus solution. We know the volume of the potassium permanganate solution. We know the molarity of the potassium permanganate solution. So if I know the volume and the molarity of a solution, I can calculate the moles of that solute. And that's really where we're going to start. That's our game plan. So if I find the moles of KMnO4, I can then find moles of iron 2 plus, and then I can find its molarity. So that's really where I'll start. So I know the molarity, I know the volume. I do need to make sure that my volume is in liters. Pay attention to those units um, if I want to have moles of KMnO4. Okay, so I get I do my math, 6.118 times 10 to the minus fourth moles of potassium permanganate. So that's sort of halfway through. If you got that correct, that's one point. Uh, and the rest of the problem was worth the other point. So if I want to find how many moles of iron 2 plus reacted with the 6.118 times 10 to the minus four moles of permanganate, I need to go back to my balanced equation and get the mole ratio. For every mole of permanganate ion that reacted, five moles of iron 2 react. All right, so I'm pulling that mole ratio from the balanced equation. And then it's very easy to calculate the moles of iron 2 plus present in that original sample. Finally, all right, this problem just goes on and on. Uh, overall, it really is a very long problem, the whole thing altogether. We know molarity is defined as the moles of your solute over the volume of the solution in liters. We just found the moles of iron 2 plus. We were given the volume of the iron 2 solution in milliliters. We have to put it into liters. Substitute that in, and we get an answer of 0 0.306 molar. We do want to make sure we have our sig figs correct. All right, we had three sig figs for the volume, um, three sig figs for the original mol molarity of the potassium permanganate, so our answer can have three sig figs. And we don't, I encourage my students not to round till the very end of the problem. Now, obviously, if you wrote this all out and did sort of one long equation to do all this work to get the answer, of course, that's correct. Um, 
and a, and appropriate to do so, I chose to break it out into parts so you could see what I was doing and follow it. All right, so we're on part E. Let's go look at what part F asks us to do. To deliver the 10.0 mil sample of the iron 2 solution that we just titrated. The student has the choice of using one of these pieces of glassware, a 25 mil buree, a 25 mil graduated cylinder, a 25 mil beaker, a 25 mil volumetric flask. All right. And the question is, why would the 25 mil volumetric flask be a really poor choice to deliver the required volume of the iron 2 solution? They want us to have 10 mils. All right, so the beaker's not a good choice because they're not very precise. The buree or the graduated cylinder could be fine. So what's wrong with the volumetric flask? Aren't they used for measurements? Well, that's true, they are. Uh, this question was scored out of one point, and my gut feeling is that um, a lot of students didn't answer it correctly because maybe they're not very familiar with volumetric flasks. So here's a picture of a volumetric flask, and you'll notice that blue line on the neck, all right, that's the... Uh, measurement for the 25 mils. In fact, on this particular graduated cylinder, if you look at the picture really quickly, it's 25 uh, mils plus or minus 0.04 milliliters. So we are measuring 25 mils very, very, very precisely, but it's the only measurement that the, the volumetric flats can make. It can't measure any other volume. If the meniscus of your solution is sitting right on that line, you have 25.00 milliliters. And if it's anywhere else, you don't know it's volume. You can only do the one volume reading. So it can't really be used to find any other volume. You would need something else. The buree or the graduated cylinder would be my choice. So the four here. The question just asks you why the volumetric flask is in a good choice. All right. But if you want it to be a measurement to the to a tenth of a mil, you need something marked to at least one mil. Okay. So Let's go on and look at part G. In a separate experiment, the student is given a sample of powdered iron, and this iron contains an impurity. So it's iron and something else, uh, but the impurity is inert. It's not reacting. And then we're going to carry out a procedure, not specified, to oxidize the iron to make iron 3 oxide, Fe2O3. All right. And so here's the data from the experiment. The original mass of the powdered iron with the impurity, we're given that mass, and then we did whatever procedure it was <laughs> and um, made iron free oxide. All right, and so that we've got the masses of those two. And the question is for part G, calculate the number of moles of iron in the iron free oxide. Okay, well, this was scored out of one point, and this is actually really easy. Every AP chemistry student should be able to do this with ease. I've given the mass of the Fe2O3. I want to know how many moles of iron that is. All right. And so I need to convert the mass to moles using the molar mass, 159.70 grams in one mole of Fe2O3. And then what I have to remember is that one formula unit of Fe2O3 has two atoms of iron, right? And so I have to take that into account to find the mole. So if you forgot to do this step, that would be problematic, all right? So you can't just find the moles of Fe2O3, you have to then calculate the moles of the iron. All right, and so you get an answer of 0 0.09431 moles of iron. So if you did all that, it's one point. Should have been easy, but I don't know that it always was. All right, so now the next thing we're asked to do is to find the percent by mass of iron in the original sample of um, the, the original powdered sample that we had. And um, apparently I forgot to do the animations on this slide. Oh, well, we're going to just run with it. Um, my plan is I'm going to find the grams of iron present and then use that to find the percent iron by dividing by the original mass. So since I just, in the previous problem, found the moles of iron, if I use the molar mass of iron, I can calculate the grams of iron, which turns out to be 5.267 grams. And then to find the um, percent of iron in that original sample, I'm going to take the grams of iron that I just calculated, divide it by the total mass of that original sample with the impurity, multiply it by 100 because it's a percent. Um, and I get 78.34%. All right, so some of the other sample was other stuff. Okay, so now some data analysis. If the oxidation of the iron in the original sample was incomplete, so instead of turning all of the iron in that original sample to Fe2O3, some of it got turned into FeO, iron 2 oxide, 
Would the calculated mass percent of iron in the original sample be higher, lower, or the same as the actual mass percent of iron in that sample? Justify your answer. This one's actually, you have to really think through this one. It's a little tricky, okay? It was scored of one out of one point, so it's an all or nothing thing, all right? But working through the reasoning is kind of important, all right? So the percent iron in Fe2O3 turns out to be about 70%, all right? But the percent iron in iron 2 oxide, all right, is closer to 78%, all right? So if the actual final sample after the procedure was finished actually had some FeO in there, that's going to raise the percent iron in your sample, okay? Um, and that's fine, but the calculations we did in the previous part assumed it was all Fe2O3, which means we're working with a lower percent iron than we actually had. So then if we use that information to calculate the moles of iron, I'm going to get a moles of iron value that is too low compared to the actual sample, which means my percent iron that I calculate in, in that original sample with the inert purity will also be too low. So this one I think was a, a problem that is a little harder to reason through, it's certainly doable, um, but you're, when you're trying to do it on, a, on the fly and you're feeling a time crunch, you might not think through the math as clearly as you need to, okay? So at this point, look back, how did you do? How many points did you earn out of the 10, all right? I can tell you that the average score on this question in 2018 was just over three, all right? I thought five or six out of the 10 points were pretty, really pretty straightforward. And there were a couple that were trickier, places where it's easy to make a mistake. So if you scored three points, you're doing fine. If you're scoring four or more points, then kudos to you and you're doing very well. Um, keep practicing, keep studying, doing practice problems. And if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, that would be a great thing to do. Have a great night, everyone.